Welcome everyone to the three hours chats with experts. My name is Isidora Salim and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, we have our speaker, Stavrula Sampani, who's a biokinetic scientist from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And today's agenda will be a bit brief, so uh, we'll have an introduction from the Marcel Holloway from the Joint Research Center. She's um, going to introduce the three R's project and about give you some brief information about the three R's. Uh, then we will join our expert Stavrula Sampani, and uh, we will finish this chat session at uh, twelve o'clock. So we will have quite enough time to answer all the questions you have for us. Um, now I would like to leave the floor to uh, Marcel Holloway uh, to tell us more about three R's uh, in general. Marcel, you can take a control of the presentation. Thank you so much, Isidora. Uh, it's really uh, nice to be here. I'm very happy to be here and so happy to see so many of you participating. Um, I lead the Education and Three Hours project at the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission. I would just try not to take too much time to explain a little bit about the project, um, but um, I would just give you some background. If I can, I cannot see it's moving on, but maybe if I, okay, I hope you can see the correct slides. So we are, Savrula and myself are actually colleagues and we both work at the Joint Research Centre, which is a research institute part, which is part of the European Commission. Uh, so we, um, we provide scientific expertise and um, support to the policy makers of the Commission in, in Brussels mainly. We are based over five member states and in six campuses, six sites, and we are based down in, uh, in Ispra uh, on the Lago Maggiore, so that's where we are now. I think there was an animation, but maybe it didn't come up. Okay, um, our little corner of the Joint Research Center here in Italy is known as the EU Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing. Uh, or ECFAM for short, and we work on the validation um, of methods, non-animal methods and research into these methods, dissemination and also promotion of these methods. But we really um, are a three R's organization basically focused on replacement methods. Um, we are here thanks to a directive that was adopted 10 years ago, which brought to life our, our center. Um, and the tasks and duties of this uh, are, are inside the directive. I don't want to go into too much detail on that. But basically, animal use in science in the EU very briefly is all about using animals for basic and applied research, for developing medicines, uh, testing the safety of medicines and chemicals, food additives and other products to make sure they are safe. Um, anyone using animals in the EU must uh, apply the three R's, replacement, reduction, refinement, under EU law. It's very strict um, and it's mandatory to use any replacement which is available. So we have the most, uh, the strongest legislation in the world. We can be very proud in the EU that our legislation that we have is, is protecting animals and really giving a strong push towards using replacement methods where they, are, where they are available. So just to tell you, uh, maybe you know already, but just to remind you about replacement reduction refinement, which underpins the legislation. So replacement is all about using cell-based in-glass in vitro methods, uh, techniques that use cells and tissues cultured in a lab or computational modeling. So using data to try to figure out or predict the effects of a substance on, a, on an organism. We can use algorithms, artificial intelligence as well. Uh, reduction is all about uh, cleverly designing your, or carefully designing your procedure so it reduces the minimum number of animals possible without, uh, w but still getting your results so you don't waste animals. And refinement is all about good housing and care practices and using proper pain relief and analgesic for the animals. And in these pictures, you can just see some examples of refinement. 
uh, where you have um, some enrichment for the animals, they're taken care of properly, um, and therefore the, the results are better in the tests and they have a, a much better life in the laboratory while they're there. So, sorry. I just wanted to explain to you that we are doing this education progress to make a, a project to make uh, young people aware of the three R's and of replacement technologies and to inspire them to go forward and maybe follow a career path uh, in this area. I'm showing you here another colleague of ours who did also a career information and a career chat some months ago. So I invite you to check out Monica's profile as well as Stavrula's. And Monica works on organ on ship in our lab here at ECVAM. Um, there is a lot of information about the three hours careers, so I invite you with your classes to have a look if you haven't already. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and hand you over to Stavrula, who will explain a lot more about what she is doing and her career path in the area of replacement methods. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Marcel. But before we go to Stavrula, I will have to first provide a small introduction for her. So, uh, as previously mentioned, St Stavrula is a biokinetic scientist in the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, particularly in the unit of chemical safety and alternative methods, which is a part of the EU reference laboratory for alternatives of animal testing or URL ECFAM. Uh, she has a bachelor's in chemistry at the University of Ioannia in Greece and a PhD in the field of material chemistry and organic catalysis from the University of Sussex in, in United Kingdom. After PhD, Stavrula joined the European Food Safety Authority to work on food context materials domain and in the area of risk assessment for plasticiers intended to be used in food packaging. So during this chat, Stavrula will provide us with an overview of the field of the three R's um, on reduction, refinement and replacement of animal use in science and answer any or all questions that you have regarding the skills, the studies, necessary, anything about her job, about her experience as a chemist. So please listen attentively and all the questions you have leave in the chat. And now, Tavrula, please, uh, you can introduce yourself a bit and tell us more what you actually do in your work. Yes, Isidora, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, yes, indeed, uh, as you said, I'm a researcher in the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission and uh, I'm exploring the biokinetic aspects related to the chemical safety in the unit of chemical safety and alternative methods. Um, well, I have a bachelor's in chemistry and a PhD as well. I define myself as a chemist primarily, uh, but I, yeah, working in the fields of um, organic catalysis of material chemistry, subsequently in EFSA, uh, getting for the first time, uh, getting to see the, the regulatory applications of science was, um, I feel that all these experiences have equipped me, to, equipped me with uh, a lot of, um, you know, I got the chance to see multidisciplinary uh, fields and, yeah, uh, get to understand, uh, to have a broader, let's say, perspective about everything uh, related to my work right now and beyond. Um, well, uh, in an everyday basis, uh, in a daily basis, I we do a lot of things in ECVAM. Marcel gave a very good introduction about the three R's, uh, refinement, uh, replacement and reduction. And basically, just to to add on that, that what I practically I practically do every day is um, to keep um, keep up to date with scientific and regulatory developments in the fields of uh, new approach methodologies like the in vitro methods and the computational methods and perform data analysis, do scientific writing, um, 
and contribute also, of course, to the communication of the of the of uh, what we achieved in the unit and in the international projects that we are involved um, to the regulators in Brussels, to to the scientific community and to the public. Um, I have regular meetings with colleagues internally and externals every day, external stakeholders and collaborators, industry, academia. Um, it's very, very interesting work. Um, yeah, when it comes to biokinetics, basically, um, I'm exploring uh, what the chemical does to the body and what the body does to the chemical, let's say, in a more simplified language. So, in other words, how how the chemical, uh, what are the adverse effects that a chemical can cause to the body, and uh, but how the body as well deals with uh, with the substances that um, we are exposed to, because the body is smart. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, of course, probably you know that with the enzymes we can digest uh, and transform the chemicals that we uh, we take every day from food, from from other sources of exposure, and the body is smart enough sometimes to transform them in more, uh, let's say, um, in, in different substances uh, via the enzymes that are less harmful or excrete them. Um, so yes, it's very, very interesting area. Um, and I get data from many sources, many experiments. Of course, we try without using animals. That's the ultimate aim. And um we we process them and we can make either predictions or more accurate let's say uh, make our results more accurate well, thank you I'm very much to, to i'm this. happy to take questions yeah yeah thank you very much for this introduction and for explaining what biokinetics actually is um before i go to the questions from the chat i have one more question for you can you also explain to our uh Listeners, what is organic catalysis? So what do you do in this area? Do yeah. you still work on, on it as well? No, I don't work on it um, at the moment. I worked on it a lot during my PhD. So organic catalysis uh, is, uh, let's say you have a molecule A and a molecule B and you want to combine them to produce a molecule C in an efficient way, though. It can be uh, with just a single step, not too many reactions, not too many pots, not too many consumables and energy, um, or in an, in an economic way, um, in the sense that somehow you try to make this product C with Mm, without spending a lot of money, right? So you have to use an extra, an external compound that is is going to actually accelerate the pace of the reaction or attribute specific characteristics to to your final product, the desirable characteristics. For example, industry at the moment, the pharmaceutical industry is very interested in specific stereostructure of products. So the chemical, not only to have some chemical groups, but them to be arranged in the space in a very specific way. And this is achievable um, with catalysis, um, the proper catalyst design that you 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 synthesize the compound, you employ it in an organic reaction under very specific conditions, and then you get the product you want. So, for example, me in the lab, I synthesized propargilamines, which are used as, as pharmaceuticals right now to combat the Parkinson's uh, disease. So, if I understood correctly, you are trying to make new substances, new molecules by fastening that process and using as uh, least as much steps in it and in um, sorry if I missed something and no, exactly, that, exactly that's that. why you use catalysis process and that's how you produce your final molecule that is used for Parkinson's disease yes right perfect thank, thank you, you. Uh, so our students from uh, Greece, they want to know how much of actually of your time you actually spend in a laboratory doing different experiments. 
Um, well, when I was uh, back in my PhD, I was 80% of my time in the laboratory because it was very practical. It was all about experiments, designing a catalyst, um, synthesizing it, applying it in organic reactions, getting the products, purify them, test them if they are good enough. Now, I because biokinetics is, um, is considered an in silico, what we say, approach, is a computational approach to predict the risks for the, for the consumer, for the environment. So at the moment, I, I'm not in the lab, but um, I use a lot of packages and softwares in order to perform my predictions. I get data from people in the lab. Uh, that work on cell cultures and the the organ on chip, as Marcel mentioned before, which is a very fancy new technique that provides you with more accurate results right now. And yeah, uh, the time in the lab now um, is uh, is uh, is not is uh, is in silico methods what we apply right now. But did you need to have some background in? Uh, computer science, statistics, in order to do this now in computational matter, in the yes. computational way, sorry. Uh, yes, um, definitely I had background in statistics and I had background in uh, programming languages, but um, is not a um, pre-requirement. Working on it and practicing on it, you you, you get to, to improve and um yes uh, is nothing very rigid that's a good thing that for example um the background that i obtained helped me a lot on what i'm doing now but it's not per se what i'm doing now it was not i it was not exactly what i'm doing now okay so you do use a lot of programming that's what are also students in english wanted to know yes i do use a lot OK, so uh, can you also tell me, um, our students are asking, was it hard decision for you to uh, leave Greece in order to achieve your goals? And um, how did you get to that decision? And was this the path you always dream you will take? Uh, well, um, it was for me, it was um, a bit of a challenge because I had to live back in Greece, my family, my friends, uh, but I really wanted to go abroad and try something different, something new. Uh, I remember how after my studies in the University of Ioannina in the north of Greece, I remember how much I was looking forward to try this Erasmus placement, which afterwards, uh, you know, it opened the door, let's say, for me to do a PhD in the same place in the University of Sussex. So yes and no, I was looking much forward to it. It was difficult to and challenging to leave friends and family behind for four years. Um, and now again, continuing in Italy is um, the same. OK, but do you have still connections with the researchers in Greece? Do you collaborate with them on the three hours maybe? Uh, yes, we have many stakeholders from around. Um, from we have stakeholders from all the countries. Uh, mostly, I have kept collaborations for my for the work following my PhD with my colleagues from UK. But uh, also, when I was uh, in EFSA, I remember how how actively in a daily basis I was I was um, having this um, communication with. Uh, bodies in in Greece because uh, I was working in the recycling of plastics and they were really they were chairing the working groups in EFSA and yes definitely a lot of interaction. Very interesting that's super cool to know that people that scientists and researchers are collaborating cross country cross national it's super nice to know that. Um, so now to go back to your work and what you do, our students from Italy are asking, um, can artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence can offer um, new data, new information and help to um, 
redu reduce, replace, and refine uh, and uh, use of animals in science. So, do you have any information of that? Do you have you ever worked with artificial intelligence in that way? Well, artificial uh, artificial intelligence exactly. Uh, not exactly indirectly, let's say. Uh, at the moment, I'm using this um, biogenetics. Yeah, it's based on computational methods, but um, it could kind of uh, be related, I would say. Um, it definitely helps a lot. It reduces the, um, the deviations and the possible errors you do. It helps you predict. Experiments are so much more precisely at the moment. Um, organized, uh, they can be organized so much more precisely. Um, huge amount of data can be processed at the same time. Without this, we wouldn't be able to really accelerate the pace of a risk assessment, especially for regulatory purposes. We have so much data from around that uh, is impossible without computational methods. And how can biokinetics more eff effectively contribute to the three hours models? How how does it contribute, to be fair? Yes, um, because you can reduce with biokinetics, you can plan experiments better, uh, or afterwards you can process uh, the data that you got in a more accurate way, and then you don't need so many uh, repetitions, so many experiments. And with biokinetics, basically the data that can be obtained in vitro, what we say in, from cell cultures, let's say, um, with biokinetic uh, principles, you can extrapolate them to simulate how it would be in the human body. So this is the strongest part of biokinetics. Thank you very much for explaining us that. Um, Sorry, there is a lot, a lot of interesting questions. I'm trying to choose ones that are still on the topic of this. So can you tell us more about the how uh, is there somewhere a direct link between because you, you were talking about Parkinson's disease and um, <clears throat> how chemicals affect from the foods can affect uh, human body. So is there any connection between Parkinson's disease and food packagings? Have you ever come across this kind of information? Yeah, well, um, yes, uh, basically, you know, the exposure to microplastics today um, can be a big issue because not everything can be metabolized 100% from the body. They tend, some of them, to be bioaccumulative. And, um, you know, the start for Parkinson's disease, I'm not, I'm not a biochemist, but because I worked a little bit in this area uh, while I was doing some sub projects uh, during my PhD with other laboratories. Um, the, the main cause is the fibrillation. So it's like many small molecules, protein molecules, they um, come together and they aggregate in a, in a bad way. And this sometimes is the fibrillation is started by small molecules existing in bioplastics sometimes. Um, so these triggers can trigger the disease or if not trigger for sure, um, can, uh, let's say, can make it go faster actually. Oh, yeah. And can you tell us maybe what is the most toxic uh, substance or chemical that humans are being exposed to now? Uh, well, uh, this is challenging. Um, there are so many, but benzene, benzene is a is a problem and is a derivative of of microplastics. Um, is a decomposition product. So yes, this could, uh, for example, this for sure could accelerate aggregation of the of the proteins in the body. Thank you very much for telling us that. So now we need to find new ways not to use benzene for so much things, actually. Um, so our students from Greece and Turkey want to know, first, as a scientist, do you have any free time? And why did you choose this path? 
And the second very big question, have you faced any kind of difficulties because you're a women scientist? Um, so these are three questions in one. Yes. So starting from the free time, you need to, to find your way around managing your time properly. It takes time. No one was born to have these time management skills or work <laughs> uh, management skills, um, especially now that in these days people change working environments so often. You just need to be very adaptable and resilient. And also this, I believe, it contributes to the innovation sometimes. Is is impressive but yeah time management is challenging um when someone is newcomer to a work it takes a bit of time to find your way around how to plan your day properly but then it comes naturally and of course i have free time i is necessary to do sports to enjoy time with friends family to after work to yes it's definitely refreshing it also brings new ideas sometimes uh, <laughs> and is contributing positively to the work. And what about your career path, considering that takes this takes a lot of, a lot of time and, as you said, requires a lot of time management. So why did you then choose to go into this type of science and in the three hours as well? Uh, because I very much liked chemistry because I felt, since I was at school, I felt that whatever I was... Um, Applying, I could see the result, and I liked this not very abstract uh, science. Uh, of course, algebra, maths, and physics, they are also amazing. They are, is, they are equally important, and they, they pre-exist, they define nature, all, all this. Uh, but uh, for sure, chemistry was, my chemistry teachers, when I was at school, they inspired me so much, and that's how I... I knew from a very young age what I wanted to do, actually. Um, it's mostly this practical application that I love. And that's how I decided to to commit to that. And it's not, it's not for me, it's something that is, um, I find it exciting. Not, it's also challenging, but it's part of the excitement, <laughs> the challenge. And did you face any difficulties by being a female in the science uh, field? Because, as we know, we don't have as much women as men in, in science, especially STEM. Yes. Well, um, myself particularly, not so much. Uh, when I uh, was in Ioannina doing my bachelor's um, and afterwards in Sussex, to be honest, it was quite a respectful environment, equal opportunities. I felt I felt quite nicely integrated to it. And... Um, at the, mo at the moment in ECVAM, we are, there are also many women colleagues and definitely a nice environment. Not, uh, I, there is no something that particularly, uh, that I particularly remember as a difficulty. But that's good. Means the field is open now. The field, I think, is very open now. Yes, yes. And the voices are heard. It's good that we can communicate from through different ways because, yeah, from publishing to to journals, scientific journals, to just uh, posting your findings in Twitter and getting some useful feedback, of, uh, you know, from colleagues. Um, Thank you very much. And can you tell us uh, what is? What is your greatest achievement? What are you most proud of? Some, or you don't have to be super proud of it, but some successful outcome that you uh, have in your career. Um, I well, there are there were many moments, but probably, uh, probably when I was in the lab and. Um, I found out that um, I was working on a project, collaborative project with a biokinetics laboratory, and we managed to um, basically, when is a multipeptide chain, uh, you cannot use more than one metals, let's say copper and zinc together, to 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 make them bind to the to this 
chain, but um, I use them in a in a smart way, let's say through a material, and I managed to make them bind both to the polypeptide. And this long term could have effects also in Alzheimer's, for example. And I was very proud of it because it was mentioned in the literature for the first time, and <laughs> I felt it was quite rewarding all the background in material science, for example, that they had. Oh, wow, congratulations. That sounds super interesting. And now to go back as well to your work. Well, first question we have is regarding the animals you're using for, well, uh, since you're a computational scientist, I cannot see that you use so much animals. But so students in Romania, they're saying, telling us that the, in Romania, they have a lot of bears. So do you think that bears are used for testing in any way? Maybe not in your electron, but anywhere else in the world. I cannot be certain about this piece of information. Bears are quite big animals, and I I would think that they are not used for testing because it's, they are big and wild animals. <laughs> it's not so used, so easy, sorry, to to use them. That's that would be my thought. But are they actually used? Do you know about it? We can I'm ask not. our students to Google and now. to check. No, I wrote in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's, no, it's not. Uh, yeah. You can find out everything about this uh, from the the commission website. All the animals that are used, how many, for what purpose. It's very, very uh, detailed. The information we have, we know a lot about it, and and in this way we can target the replacement. But also in Ekvan, we don't have any animals at all. None, none at all in the commission. It's all replacement technology here. Well, that answers a lot of our other questions regarding animal testing and how much you use. Thank you, Marcel. Um, so then we can move on to <clears throat> some other questions regarding your career. So um, first, before we go to that, we want uh, students want to know what criteria do you take in consideration to evaluate the reaction of the body when they are coming in contact with different chemicals. So is there any specific set of criteria that you have used in order to determine this? Um, well, the exposure can be from, from various sources, for example, from inhalation, from dermal exposure, from eating some food, from, yeah. Um, well, I cannot talk about necessarily the general criteria, but for sure I can talk about biokinetic models that they try to to bring all these aspects um, together. Uh, we need um, we need data, a lot of data from humans to 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 be able to to estimate how much is from this, how much is from that. Uh, but then, yeah, for example, we would imagine that me as a chemist, I would imagine that I, I know that the volatile compounds, the compounds that they can be, have a low boiling point, um, you mostly, you mostly, there is a main intake from um, dermal and inhalation exposure mostly, and not so much from oral uptake. Okay, and so, Um, so what kind of some substances then you are now testing? What, for what are you doing your computational models? For what kind of substances? Well, right now, I also have to say I joined ECVAM uh, very recently, three months ago. So for a project that I was hands-on, um, that I am hands-on this period, is uh, mostly about some chemicals that they are uh, suspected for endocrine disruption activity, so disturbing hormones, basically. Um, and these chemicals were tested in some biological assays, some cell cultures in our laboratories, and I got this in vitro data, and um, and I worked on them, and I tried to predict how bioaccumulative they are, or how easily are excreted, and therefore the risk. Uh, from the exposure to each of them. 
Thank you very much. And <clears throat> so students are also going back to your career path. So when you were a student, did you think that you will do such things in your career? And are you proud of choosing this path that you are on now? When I was a student, I wouldn't imagine this precisely. And I was not even aware about the, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And I think it's very useful what we are doing now, what you are doing now, that you're trying to help students basically to, to get a better overview of the career paths. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I although I wanted to to do science with impact in general, I knew that that after my PhD I wanted to fo which a PhD is theoretical and is that's why yeah you're a doctor of philosophy afterwards because you make something um, you you bring science one step ahead and of course it's very nice but it's not always doesn't always have practical applications the research uh, we do so although it's beautiful. So now I was very excited to do something with practical applications. And that's how I applied for EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority in Parma, to, to where we evaluate the effects of plastic materials and food packaging um, to the consumer. And yeah, after, after, after uh, getting involved in working in EFSA, this is how I heard about ECVAM. And I thought it good to, to apply here because I found it very fascinating, the very and very important the purpose of the ECVAM, the three R's. You believe this was a good match for you? Yes, yes, and something challenging as well, and very very rewarding. Working working on various projects at the moment, I find it very rewarding, and because you know it's not only contributing to the workload but also learning, and is is a very nice process for me. And so do you think that maybe this topic of three hours um, should be introduced more in the science curriculum? And do you think that these kinds of projects like the three hours can uh, help and inspire more students to uh, be involved in the problem of nature preservation? And of course, reducing and improving welfare of animals and Again, that this all contributes to the much bigger picture than just <clears throat> reducing the use of animals in science. Mm, I think both. Uh, it's very important for sure to be introduced to to young students, but to me to be promoted to all the people in the world more. We can see that even even some very senior. Um, some academics even, they can only um, understand how, how much is the dose, how much is the, the, how much chemical the mouse eat, what is the toxic dose. So, and this should be in generally, um, we should try to change their mind because it's not, it's not true. We, we saw that with in silico models and in vitro observations and experiments we have Combining them, we got so much more precise results. It's not about animals or not humans as well. We cannot be based on on a simplified testing approach in an animal. So, and this should be comprehensible by students, but also by researchers and by regulators. Is also a challenge at the moment to make even regulators to to accept that we are really close to to more precise results for humans, better predictions. Yeah, we can agree on that for sure. And uh, can you think the most difficult part of your job? Uh, the most challenging part for me is probably what I just mentioned, trying to, to be in international meetings and pass the right message to a non-expert audience and convince them that what we are doing is of high importance or that we got very good results on this and that. Uh, for me, that's the most challenging part, the public speaking and passing the right message to the, to the non-expert audience. 
And do you think the events like these and maybe smaller conferences or smaller science uh, communication events can contribute to this uh, and maybe even um, reduce that challenge for you? Do you think that if we engage general public more can help you as scientists as well, maybe get you give you new ideas even? Yes, definitely. Well, uh, talking with experts and non-experts in the field and seeing things from multifaceted aspects is always better, right? Uh, um, no, for sure. Um, I always enjoy communicating my research, let's say, in journals, presenting in conferences. is is very good. You get the chance to interact and you and you also it helps also us as researchers to think uh, out of the box sometimes because is yeah definitely definitely a beneficial process let's say thank you very much and so to go back to your work again so uh students from greece are saying that if you since you do, don't use animal what data are you using in order to to develop your computational models? Is it result from uh, some in vitro methods, so from cells, or are you using previous research? How do you co create exactly. your models? Yes, exactly. We use both uh, results from our in vitro methods, from literature, and also human data that have been recorded in the literature. Some values for me in biokinetics, this is important. Um, old uh, papers, scientific literature from experiments in animals, they also provide uh, information that um, can be of use, but um, and yeah, definitely having this is the only way to for us to manage to reduce the amount of animals used because gathering all the data to get bringing them together is the is the only way to to stop using animals bit by bit to reduce them up to a percent good percent. And students are also students from Portugal are actually asking. So, do you have any estimate when animal testing will stop? Is it even possible that will stop anytime soon? Well, um, I cannot estimate exactly if it will stop on, or when um, it will stop. This would be ideal, but for sure, minimizing it to the absolutely to the absolute <laughs> minimum <laughs> uh, is already a big milestone for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, the ultimate aim is, is to to stop their use in experiments. So this can only happen maybe by inspiring new uh, generations of scientists and researchers, engineers, uh, data scientists. So for this maybe, do you have any recommendation for schools, how they can contribute to this goal? And uh, do you maybe have some tools or programs they can involve their students. Do, are you aware of these as well? So how they can involve their students more into, into three hours? Well, um, a good start for me would be to, to elicit students' curiosity about science, first of all, in general, um, starting with some simple set up experiments at school would be good but uh, well for the three hours specifically um i think that already the um, the internet is is a source of information that could be more used at schools um what you're doing now um by you know uh, helping the students to to let's say talk to a researcher um like me or simply by youtube videos that they are related to ECVAM and to the work um also uh, the teachers can go to the to the commission's website uh, i think i provided the link to you as well where there are um there is some material educational material about the three r's i think these are the best approaches now using specific tools i'm not aware 
aware of simplified tools that do not necessarily um, uh, need, let's say, programming skills. Uh, but uh, I think starting simple is, is quite good. And do you think that doing research without animals and do researchers that don't use animals actually uh, have it have harder time to prefer form their experiments and to do research than the ones that uh, do use animals? Mm, I couldn't have an opinion on that because myself I have never tried to do research with animals. Um, so I couldn't have a strong opinion. Mm. Yes, uh, there are pros, pros and cons uh, in both cases, uh, difficulties and more easy steps. For sure, we know that in the methods that we don't use animals, we do not usually use just a single source of information or a single method. We need more than one method and that's why probably sometimes we get more precise results. Thank you very much. I hope that students from North Macedonia are happy with your answer. <laughs> and uh, students from Lithuania are also asking uh, what aspects of your job you find the worst? What you don't like, the, what you least mm. like of your work? Well, as I said, it's a learning process and it's beneficial. I don't know, I see it as a challenge and everything. Um, mostly, I would say probably uh, when I would expect an experiment. Uh, no, let's experiments was back in my PhD, but in general, let's having let's say we have a project and we expect something to work or uh, some computational <laughs> Uh, you know, calculations, they come out correctly and then you see something bizarre there, something that does not necessarily match with the big picture and you cannot interpret it. And then if it doesn't go as you planned it, um, then it's a bit challenging, can be frustrating. It needs, it needs um, dedication, persistence. It needs these type of things to be a scientist, this type of characteristics. And how do you cope with these challenges? How do you overpass them? What would you suggest to our students as well? Because in life, sometimes things don't work out as we yes, want to. I usually talk to, I usually communicate my concern to some friends and colleagues that could, I think that they could help with an advice. It's very good to communicate your thoughts, I think. Uh, one one thing is this. The other thing is that now uh, everything, all the information is available online, and as long as you can, you you search a little bit um, and you know where to search, definitely gives a lot of answers. There are some good people <laughs> that put information online for almost everything, and we students need also to start obtaining this skill bit, bit, bit by bit to know how to search online for things and to find the piece of information that much to their puzzle, let's say, without getting lost in too much information. Thank you very much. I couldn't agree more on that. The Googling is very valuable skill also for our work as well. So teaching how to do it is for me very important as well. And we have also a question. So you work in a research group, right? So how many people are in your group and can you tell us some of their specializations? Yes, um, well, we work mostly as a unit. So we are around, um, maybe Marcel can correct me on that, but 48 people, people are retiring and coming. So the, the number constantly changes the last months. But yeah, around 50 people, I would say overall. Um, there are uh, there is a lot of expertise people with chemistry background mostly biologists and toxicologists but people also with mm, uh, more biomedical background uh, biotechnologists um, even engineers even um, people that their background is mostly machine learning physicists uh, statisticians is a very 
yeah, it's really vibrant environment because people from different expertise come together. And I think that's why we, there is, uh, I don't know, that's why we get the rewarding results as well, because you put people from different backgrounds together, experts from different backgrounds together, and you get the most out of it in the projects. That's a very good point. Thank you. And uh, can you then give our students some advice how if they want to pursue careers in science and if they want to do what you do, can you advise them on what to focus on, maybe what subjects, uh, on some skills or some traits that they need to develop in order to become good scientists? So can you tell us something about that more? Um... Yes, the most important, I think, is to, to, to follow your passion and your dream. And the second most important, because we keep on growing and keep on learning constantly, so especially for young students that they, they possibly do not have a very good um, overview of things just because they're very young and they have not been exposed to different sources of information yet, I would say do not hesitate to talk to your teachers to to people from your family that they think that they are related to some scientific fields and um, that they could help you. Do not hesitate to communicate your thoughts and to, to search online also to get the pieces of information you want. Take your time, be resilient and be, be um, patient and you will, you will get there. Also, um, when you have an inspiration from the environment around you, grab it is, is a good thing. You might find a mentor, a teacher that really inspires you for talking about things. You might see that in this place, um, in this university, there is a super well-equipped laboratory that is specializing in this technique. And yeah, is a, this is a source of inspiration as well. So do not hesitate to be open. And do you have some advice for teachers? how to inspire their students more on this? Um, yes, I think for me, what it worked, what I remember the most is the chemistry and physics teachers that they were setting up simple experiments and they would exhibit them to us and they would try to explain the phenomenon practically, not only um, scientifically writing down some equations or some yeah, chemical types and equations. So um, this is something very important. Also now, um, there is a lot of material online, as I said. So a simple YouTube video um, or an informative program would be, would be also a good start, I think. Thank you very much for these advices, Tavrula. Uh, thank you very much for all your answers. And uh, I would then now wrap up the session because we have just a few minutes uh, left. So thank you all for joining us today to this career chat with Starula Sampani. Uh, we spoke about her career path, about what she does as a biokinetic scientist, what she does in her lab, how does computational method, uh, methods work, what they entail. And we spoke about a lot of uh, advices how you can become a good scientist, what do you need, what skills do you need, and uh, what path you should take. So we provided for you some advices from students, some advices for teachers, and I really hope you found this session very valuable and uh, for both you and your students and the students enjoy the session. Uh, I would like to also take this time to invite you all to check out the Triar's website, where you can find a lot, a lot of different resources. Uh, we published a, a set of new resources uh, on how on how to use and how to introduce Triar's in your classrooms. We also have translations of these resources uh, on of pilot um, learning scenarios in eight languages. So you can go check out there if your language is there. Also, I would invite you to check out uh, previous career chats with um, three other TRS experts. Um, they're from different fields, so I believe your students can 
will find it very interesting and can be found very valuable in introducing new careers to your students. So uh, if you are thinking and wondering how you can talk more about 3Rs, 3Rs website uh, is very valuable source of information for that and from there you'll get a lot of resources as well to uh, expand your knowledge and expand your students knowledge and provide them with more information on how to pursue uh, three hours as a career as well. Um, Stavrula, Marcel, I invite you as well if you have any final remarks please uh, feel free go ahead and uh, you can say as well something and um, greet and not greet thank our participants I just yeah, th I just like to say thank you so much to Stavrula. It was really, really interesting also for me because we don't always know what our colleagues are doing or what their their background is. So and I hope that um, the participants, the students and the teachers took away some very interesting things and were inspired. And this is the point of our project. We want to make people aware of the three R's because our young people usually don't know anything about it. And we also want to um, create some interest in this type of science career. Very, very interesting. And I think it's going to be the the only way really we will ever reduce animal, animal use in science. And we know we can do it. We really can do it. And it's better. It's better science, basically. It's that simple. But we want people to, to move towards this direction and if they are interested to join, you know, the scientific community working on this. So thank you again, everybody, for such a nice session. Yeah, I just to say that I also enjoyed a lot this session, honestly. And I, uh, I, I hope students and teachers do not hesitate to contact with me and ask more questions because the good thing nowadays is that you can have easier access to to people even if they are far so do not absolutely don't hesitate to communicate anything you think about science or any possible questions you have uh, thank you very much both thank you very much Stavrula for joining us today for speaking Marcel as well as always it was a pleasure uh, having you here both uh, thank you very much for joining the chat thank you um, Students, thank you, teachers. I hope you really all enjoyed as much as we did and uh, see you on another occasion as well. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm.